Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is from a brand new author by the name of Luke Reason. And I just know you guys are going to sink your teeth into this one. Of course as ever though, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Why it really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled Werewolves of Terror Vale. Let's get straight into that. Chapter 1 The Curse. Hi, my name is Romulus. I'm a former farmer turned former soldier turned former captain of the human capital city of the North. And this, well, this is my story. I was born on a farm just outside of Arborville, the smallest village in all of Garamond. I was the 250th person born in the village. My family were very poor, but we made do with the pittance of the wage we received each year from selling crops. I was happy where we lived, but like all young men, I wanted to experience the splendour that was Arbor Haven, with its beautiful white walls, magnificent towers and houses. It was a dream that would soon become ashes and dust. I lived my life working on my family's farm until the day came when all young men of Garamond are expected to make their own way in life. And so, at the age of 18, until the age of 20, I lived as a grafter, taking whatever jobs I could find, until eventually enlisting in the Arbor Haven Grand Army. Now the king would send out small patrols near Terra Vale, the dark city and sister to Arbor Haven, to ensure that no power-hungry orcs ever tried to rise up and begin a new war. And like the first war which devastated the lands of Garamond, Many good men, elves and dwarves died to stop the terrible darkness. Or so I was told by my late grandfather. Now we began hearing rumours about wild dogs prowling the empty streets of Terra Vale. But that wasn't a concern for us at the time, until a surviving soldier from another patrol came sprinting towards us, waving his hands at us and begging us not to go near the city, saying that the wild dogs were infecting the troops and turning them into massive beasts. Probably some sort of necromantic power left behind by the first Dark Lord a thousand years ago. Our commanding officer decided to recall us back to Arbor Haven. However, curiosity got the better of some of our platoon. We never saw them again after that. Well, not in their human form, at least. And just as we were out of the sight of the abandoned city, we heard a sound like a wolf, but it sounded almost human. It howled in the dark very close to us. And then we heard another one, and another. And before we could ask any questions about what we had just heard, a commanding officer confronted us, saying that we were not to speak a word about this to anyone but the king. We disobeyed the order, of course, deciding amongst ourselves that the people of Arbor Haven deserved to know of the new possible threat that was emerging. And three months after our horrific subsequent loss of men, Word began to spread amongst the populace of dogs. Dogs of almost seven feet in length and weigh more than a rhino. Working in a pack to terrorize the people of Arbor Haven, devouring children, tearing apart the women, and decimating the troops. Probably our former allies and members of our own platoon had vanished when we were recalled back to the city. And after a week of defending the villages from the werewolf curse, we decided to find out how to break the curse. My commander gave me 30 men and a promotion to captain. We were tasked with searching through the deserted dark city for any way of stopping this terrible plague. We reached the gates three days after being assigned the task and entered the abandoned city. I was completely void of life and movement as far as we were aware. But that, well, that was our first mistake. The horrors that we faced in a supposedly abandoned city when I was but a captain of Arbor Haven was worse than anyone could possibly imagine. Immediately after entering Terra Vale, we were set upon by a pack of terror hounds. I watched in horror as many of my allies and friends were dragged into dark corners or ruined buildings and then savagely bitten and clawed. And just as the last bit of life was about to leave them, they began to transform. No longer looking human, but instead a monster with teeth the size of daggers. Claws as tough as steel and fur as dark 
is the night sky. None of us were safe. I was surrounded with nowhere to go, and so I knelt down and bowed my head, expecting them to kill me at any moment or savage me to an inch of my life. But instead, they grabbed me and dragged me to the spire of Terra Vale, so that I would be interrogated by their dark master. I screamed out in horror when I reached the top of the tower and laid eyes upon the creature that was before me. For it was not a man nor a beast that ruled the terror hounds and werewolves, but a night stalker. A being that is neither alive nor dead, but bound to the mortal world, invisible to the naked eye, except for a set of sharp, pointed, razor-like teeth under a black cloak. It just hovered there above the ground before me, laughing at me in a screeching pitch, before saying, You shall be my right hand and my loyal servant. Take him to a cell of my pets and prepare him for his transformation. I was dragged into a dungeon cell by terror hounds. I then had my hands bound together and my feet bound together with chains by my former men. Only now they were werewolves. I was shivering with fear, wondering what they would do and what my fate would be, when suddenly one of the terror hounds came prowling towards the cage. Then... It slipped through the bars and began to maul me. I managed to free my hands from the chains that bound them. I found a knife that was left in the cell for the opportunity of suicide. Obviously some sort of sick joke for the night stalker. I stabbed the beast, but not before being infected with the werewolf curse. And I began feeling a stretching sensation, coupled with a ripping sensation. Then all of my important internal organs began to stop working at the same time but only for a moment as they were all simultaneously expanding. The pain was unbearable. A heart attack, kidney failure, lung failure, and liver failure all at the same time. But that's when it wasn't even the worst of it. My muscles had to rip and reform. My bones had to break and then extend and fuse back together to support the seven-foot beast. And it was then that I realized that I was transforming into a werewolf. Then one day I was released from my cell and I joined a hunting party sent by a night stalker master to thin out the army and people of Arbor Haven, enough for a full-scale invasion and conquest. The more people we bit, the more our numbers would grow. An unstoppable wave of sickness and darkness that cannot be stopped unless the night stalker was slain. However, none of us could kill him, for we were bound to serve him till our death freezes, or time takes our body and we rot in the ground. It has been a month since I last transformed. I am 80 years old now, recounting my encounter with terror hounds and the last 60 years of my life, if you can call becoming a beast a life. I am the alpha wolf of Terror Vale now, just like our master always wanted. I have searched and searched this wretched place, but I found no signs of anything that can break this terrible curse. And yet, I have found one thing that allows me some sense of normality. A tomb of power created by the former Dark Lord. It allows me to keep my identity when I transform. Slowly, we grow in power, waiting for the day when we can conquer this world. Chapter 2. Destruction of Arbor Haven. Let's get straight into that. And a war raged on for ten years between us and the humans. Neither side could get a firm foothold until one of my brightest soldiers, most trusted ally, came up with an idea that would turn the tide of this war in our favour. The city of Arbor Haven had a side gate for evacuating civilians to the mountains. We knew it was not very well guarded. The humans assumed that any assault to the city would come from the main gates. And so, I dispatched thirty werewolves to take the side gates, and with the goal of sneaking to the main gates, taking out the guards at the gatehouse and opening the gates. The plan would have gone off without a hitch. However, the Princess of the Elves decided to visit the King of Arbor Haven during the week of our siege. The problem was that the Elves insisted that they enchant the side gates, for they, like us, had discovered the obvious flaw with the city's defensive designs. What the Elves, nor indeed the humans, realized was that a small, long-forgotten tunnel led from Arbor Haven to the plains of Garamond. Originally, it was used for smuggling contraband into the city. However, now it lies abandoned, 
which was perfect for our plan. I decided to implement my plan again, only this time my infiltration squad would utilize the tunnel and emerge deeper in the city. Meanwhile, myself and the rest of the troops lined up with trebuchets behind us, manned by orcs. I gave the order to fire, and the attack commenced. The people of Arbahaven screamed in terror as rocks coated in oil and set a light hurtle towards the city. Suddenly, the werewolf infiltration squad emerged from a building deep within the city and began biting and infecting the citizens. Within the next couple of hours, 30 werewolves became 1,000 within Arbahaven. Meanwhile, myself and the remaining 220 outside the city waited patiently for our outer gates to be breached. And finally, the strike force opened the gates and the city defenders began to retreat to the second level. On the following night, we feasted on the corpses of our fallen foes. The remaining soldiers watched from the battlements in horror as many of their fallen comrades and family members were torn apart and devoured by werewolves. The night went by slowly for the humans as we prowled around the city's lower level, trying to find a way into the upper level. And normally, we would just climb the walls, however the humans had poured boiling oil down the walls and set fire to it. And after hours of lingering around the lower level of the city, we were forced to hide inside many houses of the city, for if we stayed out when the sun began to rise, we would transform into our human forms and become vulnerable to mortal wounds. I watched from the shelter of a building as at least 700 werewolves were caught out by the rising sun and began to turn back into their human forms. Immediately after, they were shut down by archers of Arbor Haven. The wee few werewolves that survived remained inside the buildings and only ventured out at night. We spent months in our human forms, but though still powerfully strong, we did not try to attack the city's remaining inner levels for fear of being wiped out, for it was another three months until the next full moon. Instead, I sent one of my fastest messengers to the task of asking a Night Stalker for reinforcements. Three days went by without a word of help for us, until the third day of our ranks. After the third day, our ranks were pretty much obliterated. With only myself, my runner, and one other, as well as a couple of hundred of orcs, left in the city. My race was almost completely spent. And suddenly, looming out of the darkness, a necro knight astride a fell beast appeared from seemingly nowhere, with a massive army of orcs, trolls, and ogres to aid us in our conquest. The necro knight ordered its fell beast to fly into the gates of the second level, smashing them into pieces. We let the orcs, trolls, and ogres attack first, as our own troops were in need of a brief rest. The humans put up a good fight, but alas, not good enough. We pushed forward until we came upon the royal palace. We found that the doors were enchanted like the side gates and that the Romanian citizens were barricaded inside with their elven princess and human king and their royal guards and Romanian human troops. We knew that only a true powerful being could break through this enchantment. I yelled up to the necro knight who was flying above us. We need your power to breach these doors. It ordered its fell beast to land in a town square. The Necro Knight dismounted and approached the doors with its blade aloft and began to strike the doors, all the while chanting in a strange strangled language that I had never heard before, the ancient language of darkness. Suddenly the doors of the royal palace exploded and the rest of my army ran in and we were quickly dispatched before I could call out stop. I yelled out for the elite orcs to move forward and attack but they wore heavy armor and had more experience dealing with the archers. After that, the trolls were sent in to keep the enemies occupied, so they had no time to think nor plan their next move. And finally, we entered. Myself and my remaining werewolves, we went straight for the king and captured him, putting him in chains and taking him to Terror Vale. We brought the human king to the Night Stalker. Whilst the rest of the army pillaged, plundered, and burned the city to the ground, and master questioned the king about weaknesses of the other human kingdoms, before finally extending his arms and converting the king into another necro knight. It was cruel, really. Rather than just killing him, a master made the king into an immortal servant. A master snapped his fingers, and the king went off to join the army like an obedient dog. Meanwhile, myself and my remaining followers were told to go and get some rest, 
for tomorrow we had a very important mission that required a small group like us. We awoke early the next morning to see the army that was dispatched to our aid had returned to Terra Vale as conquerors and victors, boasting of their success to us as if we weren't even there, as if we had not just lost almost all of our kind to a siege that was doomed to fail from the moment we werewolves had begun attacking and had to be bailed out by lesser creatures. We marched past the hordes of dark creatures, taking no notice to the endless chanting and cheering that seemed to follow us. And finally, we reached the Great Tower, where our Lord the Night Stalker resides. As soon as we entered, we felt a change in the air around us. Something was wrong. Tentatively, I stepped forward to dress in our master. My lord, are you okay, my lord? Our master spoke with a cold malice in his voice. Silence, you fool. You failed in your mission. You lost my army of werewolves through reckless tactics and sheer stupidity. And now you dare come here before me as victors like the hordes of rabble within these walls. You failed to heed the commands of your lord and master. I said move into the city and kill all but the king, but you didn't. The elves survived, and most likely are sending word to the rest of our enemies to tighten their defenses. Without the element of surprise, how do you expect to dominate our enemies and this world? I decided to speak again, foolishly, and potentially test our master's patience. My lord, with all due respect, we brought you the king. It was not my failure that the elves escaped. Orcs and trolls had entered the throne room of the king before us, and had begun attacking. We assumed that the elf princess and her guards had been killed during the breach. Our master began to lose his temper with us. The fact remains that regardless of whose fault you think it was, I had to bail you out, and our enemies know of my existence now. We cannot use the elements of surprise anymore. And so here is what I want you to do. Go to the elven kingdom of Starin, disguised as a human refugee, and use that realm as a recruiting ground. Rebuild your ranks, and then conquer the remaining elven nations. I bowed to my master and made to depart, when suddenly he called out to me. Silver tongue, do not fail me again, or I will have your head as a trophy. Chapter 3 The Realm Eternal Let's get straight into that. Each of us took a potion that suppressed our werewolf form before we departed the city the next day. We arrived at a border to the Woodland Realm three days later and decided to set up camp outside. We had been travelling for days without rest and were pretty tired and we were just starting to drop off to sleep when suddenly we were grabbed from behind then had our hands tied behind our backs and we were forced to walk at a brisk pace into the woods, where finally, after hours of marching, we reached a large wooden city surrounded by wooden walls, and on those walls were arches, at least fifty of them. We passed through the gates and up a flight of wooden steps to a massive tree, with a widened set of steps leading up to a giant treehouse above. We reached the topmost step and stumbled forwards as our captors shoved us and forced us to our knees before their king and queen. The queen of the woodland realm was fair and beautiful to look upon, and yet power emanated for with every word she spoke, whereas the king was a quiet reserved being who rarely spoke at all, and when he did, it was only ever to his wife. And the queen began to speak, addressing the captain of the guards. Well, captain, what news do you bring before my throne? The captain responded, Your majesty, I caught these four men camping outside our realm. They claimed that they were just passing through on their way to the Black Mountains of Dorwinian. Suddenly, the Queen turned to me and said, and Before I ask you what you're doing here, I wish to learn your names. And I stepped forwards and speaking very loudly and very clearly said, I am Captain Morgrim, leader of the 4th Division of Arbor Haven. Or, I was until the darkness consumed my beautiful city. Now my comrades and I are all that remains of the noble guard of the White City. 
The strongest and biggest among us is Wolfric. The skinny chap with a long beard is Malganus, and finally the fourth member of our company, lanky and hunched over, he is Remus. And as for why we are here, why, we are simple refugees of the ruined city of Arbor Haven, seeking asylum from the wilderness. Suddenly the king stood up and began to speak addressing us. You're not werewolves, are you? Word has reached me from my daughter that there's been werewolves attacking human settlements. My daughter also informed me that apparently there were no survivors from that siege of the Arbor Haven. So if you are not werewolves, and you are clearly lying about being refugees, then who are you, and what are your intentions for being in my realm? Suddenly, a guard shoved me forward and said, You will tell the truth or we will execute you. At that precise moment, the effects of the potion that was suppressing our werewolf forms started to wear off. Not only that, but the moon started to bathe the woodland city in pale light that shone through the treehouse palace, hitting us and causing us to transform. At that exact moment, the king and the queen of the wood elves started yelling orders to the guards, telling them to kill us before we could infect any of the citizens or themselves. We began our rampage through the city by killing the queen and king of the elves and infecting the princess who had taken up arms against us. The entire elven nation was converted. Then I instructed one of my companions, Wolfric, to stay behind and act as governor of the elven lichens. Malganus, Remus and I, along with the princess, departed an hour after the official appointment of Wolfric as governor. We packed up some supplies, mounted some horses, and set off for Terra Vale to deliver our report on the smoothness of our mission, and add captive the princess to our master. Once more the darkness struck and once more the light was snuffed out. The poor elves had zero chance once the first of the infected began to transform. The city guard scrambled to regain some sense of control in the chaos that followed. However, too many people had become infected by the time they had rallied their strength. It was a bloodbath, as a good 40% of the elven people were killed and eaten, and a further 20% were captured and enslaved by a group of orc slavers who happened to be operating in the area. As for the remaining 40%, they became a new subspecies of werewolf. When the orcs appeared in the midst of the battle, we knew they were not servants of the Night Stalker, but a wild tribe, for they had not been branded with a sign of the Dark Eye with teeth, but rather they bore a different mark, a black-skinned orc brute whipping a human man. And the return journey was difficult, as the wild orc tribe insisted on accompanying us back to Terra Vale to meet our dark master, and no amount of discouragement could change their minds. Not only did we have to deal with their vile company, but also the princess refused to walk with us, and insisted on being mounted on horseback. However, we werewolves had no need for horses, and could easily travel many leagues in a very short period of time. And, in our beast form, we can even outrun a cheetah. Finally, after five days we arrived at the city gates, only to find them hanging off their hinges, and not a single orc guard at his post. I was in shock, as our master had the gift of foresight that went way beyond the simple assumption of the future. We searched within Terra Vale for any sign of what might have caused such a void in a usually busy, noisy, and bustling city of darkness. Eventually, I found an orc captain, barely alive, in the rubble, who, once healed, told us the situation. Entitled Werewolves of Terror Vale Chapter 4 Search and Discovery Let's get straight into that. We were exhausted after our tedious and tiresome journey from the woodland realm to here, only to find our home reduced to rubble. The once proud city of darkness reduced to fragmented pieces of rock and ruins. We decided to stay for a few nights to recuperate and to listen to the orc who survived the siege, as he recounted his experience of the event. They came at us during the night, launching massive fireballs into the walls and over the walls towards the houses. We were all in shock and disbelief 
as the last people we were expecting to attack us were the dwarves of the White Mountains to the north of Arbor Haven. The orc said with a look of shock and fear on his face, as if he was back in the battle experience event all over again. It was just after he'd finished speaking that I spoke up, saying to the orc, My comrades and I are going to depart in a couple of days for a hidden castle in the White Mountains, where we believe the Night Stalk has fled to. You can join us and act captive here. And shown the orc the elven princess for the first time. If you wish. However, we shan't be stopping for anything. A week later we reached the base of the White Mountains and began to set up camp. However, much to my annoyance, we were not alone. Do you remember me telling you about the wild orc pack that insisted on following us to Terra Vale? Well, they decided yet again to tag along with us to the White Mountains to meet our master, and if deemed worthy, pledge their services and allegiance to him. And by the fourth day of our journey, we werewolves were beginning to wish we'd never met these filthy orc mongrels. Their continuous grunts and snarls were not even the worst of it. They stank of dirt, blood and sweat. At least we had the decency, while in our human form, to wash and bathe before journeying to our next destination. Together, we sat down around the campfire and began to eat. Slowly, we replenished our strength as we needed to recover and recuperate from our long journey. A couple of days later, at the summit of the White Mountains, we finally drew near a large castle, and with banners hanging from its high walls nearest to the gate bearing a mark of our dark master. Cautiously, we approached the stronghold and stopped before its gates. An orc sentry shouted from the top of the wall, Who goes there? This is the stronghold of Feldenost. Only those who serve the Night Stalker and his allies may enter this place. And I replied, I am Captain Morgrim, formerly known as Captain Romulus of Arbor Haven. Is this how you treat the Champion of Darkness and his comrades? And as for these fine creatures, as I pointed to the orcs behind us, they are the orcs of the Black Hand Whip Clan that aided my brothers and I in defeating the elves. And the orc turned to his superior, who just arrived on the scene, and asked him, Should we let them in? The orc captain replied, Yes, we need all the allies we can get. The orc grunted, and shouted out to the guards in the gatehouse, Open the gate! We marched into the stronghold, and began searching for vacant houses in which we could settle ourselves. However, while the orcs were given housing in the centre, my comrades and I were pulled away from the main street, and escorted up to the very topmost echelon of the city stronghold, until we reached a large chateau. We entered it to find that our master stood waiting for us before an ornate fireplace in the living room, to the left of the entrance hall. He turned around and with a big smile on his face that I could see was a genuine one said to us. My friends, welcome to your new home. I will surely be departing for Arbor Haven, so I may establish it as my new home. Once again, well done, my friends. You and your new orc troops will remain here and prepare for war and revenge. Later that very same day, I discovered that through an ancient and dark ritual, I inherited the power and rank of Alpha Wolf. And with that power, I was able to command the werewolves from anywhere in the world through a psychic link. Kind of like a hive mind. It also gave me the freedom that I was looking for. I was free from control and influence of my master. However, I was too far gone. And there are those among us, myself included, who revel in the gore and carnage that comes with being a monster. And then there are those of our kind who will only kill because they know that if they don't kill first, then they will be killed, either by enemy or by their own leaders. They consider their life as a lose-lose predicament, but I know that once they've sunken their teeth into the warm flesh of a fresh kill, they will never be the same. We are called the devil's children for a reason. I used to think of life as hell, but after my first ever transformation, I came to realize that I was meant to be what I am. I was meant to walk into that city and become the champion of darkness and right hand to the Dark Lord himself. Now even the god Aluvitar himself fears me. I am hunger. I can feed upon a mountain of corpses and not be sick. I am thirst. I can drink an ocean of blood and not burst. I am a lichen. Chapter 5 
repercussions. My brothers and I spent the next couple of days drawing up battle plans for the war against the remaining elven kingdoms and now unified human nations. We decided to go with the strategy of the divine and conquer. Knowing that we had an army of elven lichens within the woodland realm, we decided to send them forth to invade and conquer the remaining elven nations. Meanwhile, myself and my brothers decided to lead the Black Hand Whip or Clan to attack the remaining human nations of whom were considerably weaker than Arbor Haven. On the fifth and final day of preparation, we gathered what supplies and weapons we would need and departed from Feldernost, down the White Mountains and into the Old Forest, home to the great battle trolls of the First Age. I knew that, with their help, we would stand a much better chance of victory against our enemies. And twelve days later, we reached the Shadowlands, home of the Necro Knights and breeding grounds of the Fell Beasts. With more than enough support behind us, we finally reached the Barren Lands after a further three days of travelling and set up camp. We took two days to recover, and on the third day the human nations that dwell on the other side of the Barren Lands finally arrived as we had expected. I knew their honour and duty compelled them to leave their homes and their cities behind and face us in the open when no innocent blood could be spilled. We kept our airborne elite warriors in reserve to be utilised at a later time during the battle. Meanwhile, the bronze of the fighting force were orcs and trolls. The trolls tore through the ranks of human soldiers, bashing in their heads like you would a camper with a tent peg. And you could hear the screams of dying soldiers from miles away. However, the humans, they didn't stop. They just kept coming and coming. This wasn't a war anymore, it was a bloodbath. After about an hour of this hell, I finally had enough. I summoned the Necro Knights astride their fell beasts and ordered all ten of them to thin the ranks of our enemies and bring the human leaders to me. Lord Barrister, nice of you to drop in. I said as one of the lords was dropped in front of me, rather unceremoniously. And here we have Lord Riga. Now, I understand that you are a legitimate son of my dear sweet mother which is rather unfortunate for you, considering I am your enemy here and now. Who knows, maybe I'll show mercy and convert you. Hmm, decisions, decisions. Kill my own blood-related brother or turn you into a lichen. He listened to me with a look of confusion and revulsion written all over his face before suddenly saying, Brother, let me serve you. Let me prove myself to you. I promise you, you won't regret it. Please, I'm begging you. I'm your brother. Doesn't that mean anything to you? And I stood there, pondering this dilemma for a good while longer, before coming to the conclusion that I needed another lieutenant, as one of them was currently commanding at Elven Lycans. Ah, very well, I said, looking at my brother before nodding my head at him, in an action that signified I accept. I ordered for a couple of orcs to restrain my brother, then I approached him with my teeth bared and ready to bite him and seal his fate forever. When suddenly I saw his hand creep towards a knife that was concealed until now. I let him believe that he could kill me, but that was my mistake. For he was not looking to kill me, but himself. I screamed out in pain and anger as he slit his own throat before my very eyes. But he was still alive, drowning in his own blood, but still alive, barely. I lunged forward and bit down upon his right shoulder, hoping the venom would transform him before he could bleed out. His eyes started to roll into the back of his head, and he was so close to death. And then he began to transform. It was not a pretty picture, watching it happen to a family member. The muscle and organ failures, bone breaking and skin stretching. And after a minute, he got to his now lupine feet and howled into the moon. I used my Alpha Psychic Ling to tell my brother to support the right flank while I watched on as Alpha and Master Tactician. After all, I was pushing 90 by human standards at this point. I was feeling more like a patriarch than a young wolf. However, my mind and my claws were still just as sharp as ever. And finally, after what felt like hours, the battle was coming to an end. Especially when the humans realized that we had captured or killed their leaders. After we had claimed our victory, I came to the conclusion that we were what humanity should have been, always Humanity 2.0.
Three days into our return journey to Feldenost, we encountered a runner. That's what we call messengers of the pack, from the woodland realm, sent by Wolfric, no doubt, to beg for aid. Luckily for we, had just acquired a couple of hundred new troops from our own battle. Myself and my brother went off with the new lichens to aid my friend and his elfin lichens in their war. We arrived just in time to see the princess of the elves, who I thought was still in Feldenost, leading an assault on what used to be her own city, with the aid of many an elf from other nations. Looks like we got here just in time, her huh, brother? I yelled out to my brother, who was standing beside me shaking with excitement for the thrills of battle. And Wolfric emerged suddenly from a mass of bodies and broken spears he'd been using to catch his breath. You know, I'm not as young as I once was. All this damn fighting is too much for an old dog like me. I'm almost a hundred, for Aluvatar's sake. He said while trying to steady himself against a tree. That's good to see you too. I'm sorry about the princess. I never thought in a million years she would, or could, ever escape Feldenost. I said bowing my head. Amongst that kind, bowing one's head is asking for forgiveness. Anyway, we've come to help. And if I get the chance, I'm going to kill the elf princess myself. If it's the last thing I do. I said as I glared daggers in the direction of the elven forces that were retreating upon my arrival. We decided on flanking and boxing in tactics. My brother and half of our forces would wait just out of sight of the elven armies, while myself and the orc captain I'd saved the Terra Vale, named Snarlamane, who insisted on becoming my bodyguard from that point on, flanked the elves from behind from the mountain pass. And with the other half of my army, it worked. The elven forces fell upon the elven lichen city walls and were immediately surrounded and slaughtered. And with the last survivor being the princess herself, I transformed myself back into my human form to make it a fair fight for her before saying to the princess, Your people are dead. Your life is mine. You can fight me and possibly defeat the Alpha Werewolf. Or I can give the command and at least 10,000 hungry wolves and one orc can feast on your pure, untainted flesh. It is your choice. And she stood there staring into my eyes with her beautiful blue eyes for a good couple of minutes before saying, I have a counter offer. Convert me and make me your wife and queen of the Elven Lycans. And in return, we can have what your master deprived you from having all those years ago. A family and a normal life. I left the woodland realm two days later, feeling heartbroken and cold, knowing that I had just doomed my soul to torment and misery for the rest of my worthless life. Because I knew I could not have a normal life as long as my master lives. My forces and I travelled back to Feldenost in complete silence. They knew I didn't want to leave the Elf Princess, but that I had no choice. True happiness is for the free, and the free of heart, of which I was neither. Darkness had already tainted my soul. I can't just live a happy life, which I had deprived others of. And we finally reached Feldenost, only to find the gates already open, and the guards pointing their bows at us. I told them to stand down, but instead one of them loosed an arrow at me which I caught with lightning fast reflexes before throwing it back to the sender and killing him instantly. Night Stalker! I yelled out at the top of my lungs four times before he finally appeared with the elven princess in his grasp screaming the words. I warned you before, Silvertongue, never to fail me again. And yet not only did you allow your prisoner here to escape, but then when you had a chance and opportunity to kill her, you let her live. I must admit, I am disappointed in you. They say revenge is sweet. Well, this is my revenge, for I will not accept disobedience and ignorance from my intelligent subjects, such as yourself. You can either kill her yourself, or I will. And trust me, if you leave her life in my hands, I promise her death will be slow and painful. You have one minute to decide. After what felt like hours, it was only a few seconds, I finally said, Give her to me. I'll do it myself. I took her from him before whispering in her ear, Stay still and don't try to transform once the venom's inside you. You'll collapse from the struggle with the inner beast, but once you're unconscious, you'll be safe. I'll have you taken away to the chateau 
where you'll be safe. I bit into the shoulder of the princess and began to drink her blood. I then stopped myself before I became the cause of her death. My master cackled with delight. <laughs> Seeing the limp body of the princess at my feet, he then vanished in a puff of smoke and left me to my much needed rest. Once he had departed, I called for my assistants to bring the princess up to my chateau. The Yorks and beasts that garrisoned the stronghold city returned to normal once the Night Stalker had departed. His will and dominance was clearly too much for them. Chapter 6 Knowledge is Power Let's get straight into that. Three years after the Night Stalk almost took my love from me forever, I was happily married with two children, being part elf, part human, and part lichen. During these three years following the Great War, our enemy kingdoms were transformed into states of the now Lycan Empire. There were a few pockets of resistance here and there from human rebels and the dwarves, but an empire at my command, I knew they possessed little problem for us. During my wedding, the Night Stoker made an appearance to remind me that I was his property, and if I ever forgot that, I would lose everything I hold most dear to my repairing heart and soul. Though my wife didn't like it, I had soon slipped back into my old ways once more. War, bloodshed, and carnage, all to protect my family. Our biggest enemy was my master. As long as I maintained control of the Empire, my family would remain safe. But of course, I didn't believe that. That was why I moved my family to the ruins of Terra Vale. I had some of the finest magicians in the world cast a concealment charms over the place to give it the appearance of a ruined city, while we rebuilt it in secret. It was to be used as a refugee for those who I had genuine mercy for, or for those I loved, like my family. You know the old expression, knowledge is power? Well, my master had no knowledge of my plans and intentions, giving me the advantage later down the line. And for years we quiet rebellions and made shaky, uneasy alliances with dwarven nations, all the while searching for cures to lycanthropy. Eventually, after five years of research, we discovered that the cure to lycanthropy was exorcism. Luckily, there were still some priests of Aluvita in the world. On the peaks of the Ashen Mountains is a highly fortified holy city where both elves and men live together in harmony. And just to be clear, we allowed them to remain independent because they did not take up arms against us. And the Night Stalker decided one day that orcs and trolls belonged to him and him alone. And so, all of the orcs and trolls were of a court to Arbor Haven. Even the Necro Knights came to him. I, however, had one Necro Knight, my former king, and a single orc clan still loyal to me. I knew the game my master was playing, and I knew how to counter him. You see, priests are not formidable against my kind and the subspecies Lycan elves, but also perfect counters for a being of pure darkness and his evil minions. My plan was ready to implement. Now, if I were to ever be threatened by the Night Stalker ever again, I would implement my plan and nobly declare war on my master, while simultaneously proclaiming myself as Emperor of all Lycans, something I was forbidden from doing. Since in the eyes of my master, I was still considered a slave. But without me, he would not be commonly residing in Arbor Haven. Without me, this world would still be a world of chaos and not one of order. And without me, the Night Stalker would have a considerably smaller army. Unbeknownst to us, our Dark Master was making schemes of its own to topple my power base and to secure ultimate power in the world. We, my brother and I, spent a couple of days to gather supplies and a small contingent of troops, and then we departed for the Ashen Mountains to find the Holy City. Luckily for us, the Ashen Mountains only took a week to reach I was very lucky considering we only had supplies for two weeks. We picked a spot halfway up the mountains to camp and recuperate for a couple of nights before continuing to the peak to find the holy city. Now we reached the gates of the city by the third day and were greeted by a rather less than welcome welcoming committee. Arrows pulled back and aiming directly at us by elven archers and a rather large group of human soldiers wielding swords and shield and throwing spears 
and shields marching out through the gates to surround us. Then the high priest of the holy city appeared suddenly on the wall to question us and pass judgment on our souls. The high priest called out to us, Who are you and what is your purpose here? And I stepped forward and yelled back, I am High Lord Morgrim, leader of the Lycans, an elven Lycans, a master of Ferdinost. I have a proposition for you. He then waved his right hand at his guards in a clockwise motion, signaling them to return to the city and stand down. He then looked back at me and called out to me, You may enter the city, yourself and your brother, I assume. However, your entourage must wait outside. If they are hungry and thirsty, we will provide them with supplies. Entitled Werewolves of Terror Veil. Vale. Let's get straight into that. Chapter 7 Under Siege. On the second day within the holy city, I decided that the orcs that accompanied us should be allowed within the city. I requested a meeting with the high priest and finally, after a couple of hours of waiting at our temporary residence, a single cleric escorted by two soldiers arrived at the doors to escort us to the high priest. We entered the palace of the holy city and saw the high priest seated at the end of a long oaken table. As we approached the table, the high priest spoke up saying, Welcome my friends! What do I owe the pleasure of this meeting that you have set up with me? I stepped forward and said, My brother and I would like you to allow our orcs within your city. They were not the servants of the Night Stalker, but loyal and trustworthy allies that have proven themselves time and time again. After a few minutes of silence preceding my case to the High Priest, he finally spoke up again, saying, Very well, but just remember that their actions are on your shoulders. After a week after my meeting with the high priest of the holy city, my master arrived before the walls of the holy city with a vast army larger than anything I'd ever seen. Legions of orcs, trolls, ogres, nine of ten necro knights waited for the dark lord to signal the attack. My master yelled out my nickname in an angry and impatient tone of voice. Silver tongue, join me once more, or I will find your wife and children and cut them. Then I will feed them to my forces. I turned to my brother and said quietly, Rigor, do you think we could sneak out of the city without being seen, along with our orcs, our Lycan brethren, the high priest and a handful of holy clerics? My brother replied nervously, I am not sure, brother. Maybe, but this city's defenders will need to buy us enough time to escape and descend the mountains with all of our company in tow. And I replied to my brother, saying, We should try at the very least. I shall inform the high priest of our decision while you tell our forces to gather supplies and wait for me at the rear gate. And finally, after much arguing and debating, the high priest and a small group of clerics followed me to the rear gate with my brother Rager. The two hundred Lycan guards and our orcs awaited our arrival. I moved to the head of the company and led us out of the city just in time as the first of the five was from our masters. Trebuchets landed amongst the buildings, setting them ablaze. And by the time the last member of our company vacated the city, it was already half destroyed. I, however, intended on luring the Night Stalker into a trap. Deep within the city, I had created a magical firebomb that would engulf every living thing within the walls in flames. I knew that if a dark beast were to approach the bomb, I would go off. I wanted to show my now former master that I no longer feared him. Five days later, we reached the city of Terra Vale, and I began weaving a spell upon the clerics and high priest that would allow them passage through the barrier around the city. Once within our city walls, I explained to the high priest of the former Holy City that his city and most of its inhabitants had to be sacrificed so that we might escape. Uh, he wasn't happy about it, understandably, but he nodded his head in agreement, and so that for us to plan a counter-attack, we needed to feign our defeat. 
My wife and children welcomed me at the gates with the biggest hugs. Although we were deeply in love, my wife and I knew we had our own responsibilities to attend to. My brother Rager and I entered my royal residence and sat ourselves down at a long, ornate wooden table, meant for kings and queens. And after a couple of minutes, servants approached the table, laden with dishes full of delicious meats. After all, we are carnivores. We gorged ourselves on the sweet succulent meats imported from the other states of the Lycan Empire. And as we feasted, we allowed our advisers to enter the dining hall and sit at our table. They, too, gave in to their animalistic tendencies and joined us in our feasting. And after an hour, we began strategizing our next move and planning for the future. A future without the Dark Lord. A week later, an orc scout arrived back from the city gates and informed us that the Night Stalker and his armies were on their way back to Arbor Haven and would arrive in just over a week's time. Given how large his army was during the siege of the Holy City, I have to say I am not surprised. Have you ever seen 100,000 soldiers marching somewhere at the same time? It's incredible, but at the same time, very time-consuming. It's, no it's no wonder that they would take so long to get home. I had a plan in mind to deal with this colossal threat. However, it would take time to implement, and time was the very thing we were running out of. Firstly, we needed to make the bombs with a combination of metal and magic. Secondly, we needed at least 20 sacks in order to carry the bombs to Arbor Haven. And finally, I needed a partner. For this mission, I decided that my brother needed the training and infiltration and stealth. Werewolves of Terror Veil vale. Chapter 8 My Revenge Let's get straight into that. After three days of planning, we decided to sneak into the ruins of Arbor Haven and plant the magic firebombs like the one I'd left for my former master in the Holy City. My brother and I snuck out of our city in the middle of the night. Three days later, we arrived outside the outermost walls of Arbor Haven and carefully snuck into the ruined city. We began carefully and strategically planting the bombs throughout the city. And from a large tree, I watched the Night Stalker and what remained of his forces entered Arbor Haven through the main gates. Immediately after entering through the main gates, the first of 20 bombs exploded, killing 25% of the Night Stalker's army. However, my former master ordered his remaining forces to continue into the city and that one little bomb was not going to stop them. And after about an hour, only the Night Stalker remained. And once the Night Stalker entered the city, I began to send an old oak tree, and once on the ground, I took one look around before transforming into my beastly form, and sprinting back to Terra Vale in a single day, as I no longer had anything to carry on my back. My brother had already departed as soon as we completed our mission. Three days later, outside the walls of Terra Vale, I met up with my brother and praised him for his work during the mission. After a couple of days of rest, we, my brother and I, assembled our loyal orc clan and a couple of hundred lichens and departed the city of Terra Vale for Arbor Haven to check for survivors and search for any sign of the Night Stalker. Luckily for us, the Dark Lord was long gone. No doubt, he's currently coercing the wild orc clans into joining him, which of course would be very bad news for us, considering there were more wild orcs than there were under the servitude of the Night Stalker. And seeing that there was no point in sticking around the fallen white city anymore, we decided to return to Terra Vale with a handful of injured and barely conscious trolls in tow. Once we finally arrived at Terra Vale, I ordered a like of medics to heal up the trolls and then ordered a couple of a hundred Lycan guards to accompany the trolls to the medical center in the middle of the city. And once the trolls had recovered from the surgery, I summoned the holy clerics to perform an exorcism on the trolls to rid any trace of the Night Stalker's power and influence from them. Once the trolls were cleansed for the darkness, I approached them and began asking them to join me. Unlike the Dark Lord, I wouldn't force anyone to join me. I'd always given them a choice. After a couple of days of recon on my former little up, after a couple of days of recon on my former master's new army, I was feeling a little bit more confident about our upcoming war with the Night Stalker. 
especially as we had just secured the loyalty of the last of the trolls of Garamond. Not only that, but I had sent some of my Lycan brethren to find and convince as many of the wild orc clans as possible to join us. In addition, I'd also sent some of the holy clerics to the secret dwarven nations to forge an alliance with them. Finally, the board was set, and the pawns were plentiful to be sacrificed for the greater good of the world of Garamond. After a couple of days, we began to get nervous as we not heard from any of our scouts concerning the Night Stalker's movements. It was then that I realized that a strong hive mind psychic connection I had with all the lichens of Garamond had vanished. The Night Stalker had been eradicating all the lichens throughout the world, so that now the only lichens left alive are myself, my family, and a couple of hundred within our city walls. Werewolves of Terror Veil vale. Chapter 9 Darkness Civil War Let's get straight into that. Over the next couple of days, I, along with my brother and my other lieutenants, Malganis and Remus, began speculating where our former master would be residing. On the third day, an orc guard knocked on the meeting room door and proceeded to tell us that Wolfric had arrived outside the city gates with a thousand elven lichen survivors. I abandoned the meeting and immediately rushed through the city to the city gates to welcome back my comrade, who I had thought had been butchered by the Night Stalker's hands. We embraced in a bear hug that would have broken the bones of any regular mortals, and then he stepped back and said to me, Our master has taken up residence in Starine. We were attacked seemingly from out of nowhere. The few elven lichens who stand before you are all that remain of their people. Brother, we must strike back. We must cast off the shackles of darkness from the world and restore peace. And I bared my teeth before replying. The night stalker won't know what hit him. I then turned around to address the elven lichen, shouting out, You have all been betrayed by a dark lord, who was meant to be your friend and ally. For this vile betrayal, I promise I won't rest until the blood of your fallen is repaid a thousandfold, and the Night Stalker is destroyed. They all erupted into cheers, and then suddenly, from amongst the crowd, one of them stepped forward and said to me, My lord, nothing can kill your former master except for the legendary blade, Excalibur. However, it is commonly located deep underneath the holy city which is commonly heavily guarded by the Night Stalker's elite guard. You may have to sacrifice a few thousand lives to acquire it. The very next day, myself, my brother, and my lieutenants gathered in the Great Hall to plan our war strategies against the Night Stalker. Eventually, it was decided that my brother and I would find the sword, with a couple of hundred lichens accompanying us whilst Warfric, Remus, and Marganus led the main bulk of the army. One necro knight astride a black fire drake, a thousand elven lichens, eight hundred human lichens, or purebloods, two hundred trolls, the last of their kind, and roughly eight thousand orcs to engage and distract the night stalker long enough for me to find and claim Excalibur. After two more days of planning and preparation, we set off for our respective missions. My brother and I, along with our infiltration squad, approached the Church of Terror Vale a brand new addition to the city, so that the high priest could, with the help of his clerics, teleport us to the holy city. And the guards at the Night Stalker station within the holy city were in momentary shock and disbelief as we seemingly appeared from thin air and started attacking them. I smiled with glee and licked my lips for the bloodbath that was about to happen, for they were not orcs but corrupted men, and the blood of men always tasted good. Imagine finding that perfect bottle of red wine, that's what it's like for us when we feed on the blood of our enemies. We reached the walls and started climbing whilst arrows flew towards us on the battlements, but none of us died to them. Once the city walls were taken, I ordered for a handful of our company to stay behind, keep to the shadows, and send a runner if they see anything or anyone approaching, whilst the rest of us proceeded forward into the city. And after a short while, we reached the entrance to the city catacombs, proceeded down into the very bowels of the holy city. 
The air was thick with the smell of decaying bones and disease, ridden rats. We travelled in single file through the narrow tunnels, until finally coming out into what looked to be an old monastery, where the altar would normally be stood, a large sword steadfast in solid rock. Excalibur! I exclaimed in awe and wonder. I took a few steps forward, cautiously and tentatively, testing for any traps, but there were none. I then strolled forwards confidently and grasped the sword with one hand and pulled. And at first, nothing happened. But then, ancient inscriptions began to materialize on the blade, saying, Whomsoever pulls the sword from the stone, should he be worthy, shall possess the power of death to the undead. And finally, after what felt like hours, we reached the surface and ran through the empty city to the outer walls where we reconvened with our guards on the wall. After collecting all of our equipment, we set off for the woodland realm to confront the Night Stalker and his army. And we arrived two days later to see the elven lichen city of Starine under siege from thousands of orcs. Caught off guard, our enemies were not expecting an attack from behind, and luckily for us, the last remaining dwarf clans arrived at the exact same time as us. Things were looking up. Sensing that he was about to lose the war, the Night Stoker decided to challenge me to single combat. I accepted the challenge, and collected myself for what could possibly be the last and toughest fight of my life. Both mine and the Night Stoker's soldiers formed a circular formation around us in order to view the spectacle and stop either combatant from fleeing. The Night Stoker wielded a massive blade four feet in length, and upon his body he wore black scale armor, probably made from dragon hide. He moved with such speed, and with each stroke of his sword, he made me stagger back at least ten paces, after I attempted to block with my severely damaged and worn shield. Finally, after what felt like an hour of being battered and bruised, I saw my opportunity to strike back. While he was wailing on me with his great sword, I noticed his left boot kept buckling under the pressure produced by his swings. Suddenly, without warning, I struck his left leg with Excalibur, cleaving it clean off. He howled in pain. Although his body wasn't visible to the naked eye, his body still reacts the same way as any other creature, immortal or mortal. Immediately following my first strike, I then chopped off his other leg, followed by his leading arm, leaving him crippled and debilitated. I wanted him to suffer, to feel unimaginable pain, like the pain I feel every time I transform. And finally, after hours of torturing my former master, I ended the war and the hundred years of darkness by lopping the head off the Night Stalker, with Excalibur simultaneously breaking the Lycan curse and freeing the world of Garamond. I held up the helmet of the Night Stalker and yelled out to the orcs that served him, Your master is dead. Surrender and you will be spared. The war is over. The legions of orcs that were forced into serving the Night Stalker turned around and began to run away. I ordered all of my troops to stand down, and together we all marched back to Terra Vale, to once more retire from war and carnage and live out our lives in peace, a well-earned peace that we had been craving for over a century. Epilogue it has been twenty years since the Great War where I slew the Night Stalker. My wife and I raised my second son together in that time, between then and now. My oldest son is now twenty, and my second son is eighteen. We are enjoying our time together in peace as a family. And sure, I still have to govern my people and that of the elves, but I make time for what's truly important, family. I must admit sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night with a look of pure fear written across every inch of my face, and sweat absolutely dripping from my body, like I've come out of a swimming pool, the image of the Night Stalker permanently etched into my brain. My eldest son and I lead the cured, as we call ourselves since our curse was lifted, and as a cured man, I find myself growing very weak and frail, practically every day, as it was only the lycanthropy that was keeping me from growing old. 
There is so much I wish I could still teach my sons, Arthur and Bane. But at 102 years of age, I now know I am not long for this world. Maybe another year at most. My name is Morgrim, formerly known as Romulus the Lycan, who broke the curse. And if you are reading this, this was my story. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What a fantastic, ferocious adventure there. And from the incredible mind of Luke Risen. Brand new and exclusive to the DMT Forest of Fear channel. Absolutely huge congratulations to you, Luke, for penning this incredible hit. As I'm sure you've seen from the comments, your work has been received extremely well from the wonderful folks at home. I honestly can't wait to see what else you produce in the future and wait with bated breath for any updates to these characters and storyline. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now, if you have a story to tell or possibly have penned something along this caliber that you think we could all sink our teeth into, then please do get in contact with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope you're all well and happy taking a fight back to life, guys, and getting back into the swing of things. And I hope you're looking forward to the Halloween season as much as I. But above all, guys, remember... Be safe, not sorry. And sure, I still have to govern my people and that of their elves, but I make time for what's truly important, family. Fuck the neighbors. My mouth's burning. Hmm? My mouth's burning from something. Probably too many sweets. Burning from something. Probably too many sweets. No, it's not sweet. It says burning hot. I don't know, kid. Well, that spicy thing. Oh, it's monkey thing. Monkey, monkey face. No, monkey thingy, Bob. What monkey thingy, Bob? Ah, oh, it's that thing that we had together. And I was cutting nuts, eating... Oh, Bombay mix. Yeah. Monkey thing. <laughs> I wonder if he ate that. I did eat that. Okay. Luke got it. Once the Night Stalker entered the Holy City, fuck you. It's incredible, but at the same time, very time consuming. It's no wonder that, it's no wonder that they would take so long to get home. I had a plan to mind to deal with this colossal threat. I had a plan in mind to deal with this colossal threat, though. I had a plan in mind to deal with this colossal threat, however. It would take time. Fuck you. They, too, gave in to their animalistic tendencies and joined us in our feasting. And after an hour, we began strategies. Strategy, G, G, G. Did you just fart? I need to know. Did you fart? Otherwise people are going to go, oh, he farted in the recording. Nine of ten Necro Knights waited for the Dark Lord to signal the attack. My master yelled out my nickname in an angry and impatient tone of voice. I can't remember the evil guy's voice. Simpson. Smithers. Smithers. 